Hi everybody, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I've put together a little video for you guys um, to show you some of the basics behind conducting. Um, in this unusual time, we thought it might be a good idea to uh, use this time that we have uh, for you to, uh, to get to know what it actually is that a conductor does, because I can certainly remember from my time at Youth Orchestras that I often didn't have a clue about what a conductor was doing or was asking me to do or was saying uh, in general. So hopefully this video will go some way to dispelling some of these questions or myths uh, for you, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so um, as you know, the, the conductor normally stands in front of the orchestra. So how we stand and, and, and just, just our overall physical health is really important when you conduct uh, because it's very easy to get short shoulders, short back, short, so our wrists, whatever, very, very easy. So we just want to make sure that we start with a nice warm up. Um, and let's begin uh, by just checking our posture. Uh, our feet are roughly shoulders width apart. Our knees are nice and soft. Just give those a nice little wiggle, maybe good, wonderful. And the hip is nice and, uh, uh, nice and relaxed as well. Yes, yeah, good. And let's imagine the back of our head is being pulled up by a string and makes just see if we can grow those one or two inches more. Good. All the while we want to make sure that our shoulders are nice and relaxed and um, down. We're not raising our shoulders. Our arms are just gently by our sides like so. Good. I think that's good. Now just make sure, just scan your body. Just make sure that there's no unnecessary tension. And if there is, just, just see if you can move that body part a little bit and just see if we can relax that body part a little bit. Good. We're just going to do a little bit of that now, just to warm up our body. So we're going to start with the shoulder roll. Let's go backwards firstly. Wonderful. And let's change direction. Wonderful. Good. And let's do the same thing with our hip. We're going to draw a circle like so, with our hip, yeah, like, that's it, exactly, good, keep everything else nice and relaxed, let your hips lead you, and let's change direction, same thing, good, wonderful, so, and then we're going to shift our weight over to our left leg, like so, we're going to uh, lift up our right, right foot and we're going to draw circles with our foot like this, um, giving our ankle a nice little um, massage. So just uh, draw a circle, let's go clockwise first, with your foot, like this. Good, and let's change direction. That's it. That done. Good. Now let's go over to the other foot. Same thing. Same thing. If you need to hold on to something, then please do. But we're lifting our left foot up, and we're going to do the same thing starting clockwise. That's it. And change direction. That's it. And lastly, we're going to do the same thing with our, with our hands um, and we're just going to draw circles with our fingers and give our wrists a nice little, a nice little massage. So let's do that together, uh, maybe in mirror motion, both hands together. Here we go, like this, good, good, and let's change direction, so going the other way now. Good, and let's shake everything out, nice and relaxed, wonderful. Good, so um, let me just demonstrate it, what, what happened the first time that I ever stood, well, or tried to conduct, what happened to my posture as soon as I was told to, to lift up my hands and, and start conducting. This is what happened. Yeah, so my, my hips immediately shot back and I was sort of leaning forward as though I was having back a, a terrible backache and and the reason for that was because of actually the unexpected 
added weight is in front of you by your arms just being in front of you like this there's a you know a whole lot of extra weight pulling you forwards so your upper body might be being pulled forward and your hip to compensate is being pushed back like so and that obviously doesn't look very healthy for the long term so we want to make sure that as we conduct we're standing well and the way to do that is really just to, to hone in on our lower back actually our arms have the muscles connected all the way to, to the back to the uh, to the middle of our back here so so our, our, our arms are not just being lifted by our shoulders but actually the back is very much important in, in lifting uh, our arms so let's just make sure that we engage those uh, our back when we lift our arms uh, and there's a, there's a good metaphor for, for learning how to do this one of my teachers taught me this so imagine uh, there's a big big trunk in front of you we're going to hug a tree basically yeah um, so imagine that big big trunk in front of you and you're standing right in front of it and we're just going to hug this tree so whenever you're ready lift from your lower back and hug this tree good now you can see, you, you might might feel a bit of weight in your lower back that's absolutely fine just drop your drop your drop your arms one time to your side good 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 wonderful do the same thing again lifting from our lower back our shoulders remain nice and down and relaxed it's all from the lower back that's it yeah do the same thing one more time here we go let's lift and hug that tree yeah we've got that nice big sort of circle around here which is also quite quite important for other reasons good so the rest of these um, the, these demonstrations I'm going to be doing with a baton. If you don't have one, don't worry. You can do any of these exercises either with a pencil or something like a pencil, uh, or you can do it just without anything and just do it with your hands. That's absolutely fine. Um, but for the sake of this, uh, for these exercises, I will be using a baton. Um, and and one more thing that I should mention is that I'm right-handed, therefore I will be leading with my right hand through all. I mean, I normally conduct with my right hand. Uh, if you're left-handed, uh, you do the same thing with your left hand. Yes, your leading hand, whatever your leading hand is, is the one that you conduct with. And uh, so just, just try and, and mirror everything that I do um, if you're left-handed and you want to try this out. Um, so the first thing that we're going to try and do is hold our baton correctly. So we're going to put the cork end of our baton uh, just cl fairly close to our wrist, like so. We're going to uh, put. Uh, we're going to place it so that it's pointing between our thumb and our index finger, like so. Let me show you. Good. Then we're going to grab it gently, gently with thumb and uh, and and index finger, like this. Good. And we're going to wrap the other fingers around, like so. And there you have basically you have the. Uh, the basic hold for uh, for the baton, like so. We don't. You, you make sure that you don't. You're not gripping it. You're not gripping. You're holding on to it for dear life. You want to make sure that uh, there's a nice sort of fluidity to your hold of the baton. It's nice and loose uh, and generous, um, because any tension that you create here, you will feel here and in other parts of your body fairly quickly. So just make sure that you're very aware and very conscious of not creating any unnecessary tension straight away. Good, so the first thing we're going to, going to do is just we're going to draw a circle this time, and just as we did with our feet and our hands earlier, and our hips indeed, and um, we're going to draw a circle with the tip of the uh, baton. Yeah, so imagine maybe you had some paint here and you're, you're drawing on a, uh, on a canvas, on a blank canvas. And we're just going to draw some circles, it can be any size that you want. In fact, why don't we start off small? Let's make a very small circle firstly. Good. That's it. And let's draw it. Let's make them bigger. And bigger. And why don't we make one really big circle once? Yeah. Well, uh, fairly big. I think we can go even bigger, maybe. Good. So obviously now we're using the whole arm here to draw the circle, which is maybe not unusual, but it's not necessarily always necessary to use this much gesture 
in everything that you're doing. So let's go back to just drawing of a nice and short and small circle, I mean, like this. Good. Great. And now since we've done that, maybe we can try a little figure of eight. So we're going to um, we're going to draw a figure of eight with the tip of our baton again and it's uh, going to go down down to the left bottom like this, up and around, down crossing over to the right, and up again, and down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Good. Good, and if you're getting on with that quite well, then maybe you can speed it up a little bit. So, just find a little bit of sway. Just in between each one of these. You may even want to start counting in your head, going uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and so on. Good. Now, if you want to challenge, if you want to challenge, we can rotate this figure of eight by just switching where the, the figure of eight begins. So we're going to go deeper, we're going to go down, down to the side, up and down to the side, up. Good, keep, keep going, good. All right, now we are exactly on the inverse of what we did earlier. Good. Now keep going. Imagine that figure of eight tilting, spinning around on its axis. Good. Good. And there we have it. To understand the role of the conductor, it's probably worth looking at where the art of conducting actually comes from. Conducting in the form that we know it today is actually a very recent addition to the music scene. For much of music history, orchestras and choirs were not directed by a conductor, but by a member of the orchestra or by somebody leading from the harpsichord, for example. Modern conducting developed as orchestral music grew into something altogether more complex. This happened as composers added more and more instruments to the score and consequently the orchestra grew and grew in size. The big sizes of ensembles made it increasingly challenging for the musicians to efficiently communicate with each other. Therefore, having a conductor in front of the orchestra who could act as a kind of conduit for the musicians to communicate became the norm as orchestras grew in size and size and as music became more and more complex. So, from this we can see that one of the responsibilities of the conductor is to communicate with the orchestra. It's important to understand that an orchestra makes music with a conductor and vice versa, rather than under the authority of a conductor. So part of the trick with conducting an ensemble of musicians is to understand the subtle nuances between moments when the orchestra needs you to be very clear and guide them, and moments when the orchestra is more than capable of looking after the music themselves. This is hard to do and it takes experience to get a feel for it. A good analogy one of my teachers once passed on to me was that uh, of uh, riding a horse. There are moments when you need to lead the way and guide the horse, and then there are moments when you can relax and trust the horse. It's the same with conducting an orchestra. Trust and respect works both ways, and it is therefore a crucial aspect of the job. So, we've already been showing some beat pattern there, actually, um, very gently. If you've been counting like I did, one, two, three, four, five, six, that could have been either a three, four, or a six, four, or a six, eight, whichever you, do, you prefer time signature that we were just showing there. But let's just go back to basics now. We're just going to look at a simple downbeat and up. And the, the clue is in the title. The down is down and up is up. Okay? So let's start, let's start with the down. So we need to start fairly high to, to do it, yeah? And we're going to just draw a little line maybe to the center of our belly. Just uh, let's make sure that it's in front of us as well, like this. Let's go up again. That's an upbeat, we would say. 
and down. Good. And up again. And down. And up. And down. And up. Down. Up. Down. Good. Now, if we were to, uh, to fasten, uh, to speed this up, sorry, um, like, like this. It's very difficult for, still to read that, isn't it? Uh, and you wouldn't really be, be able to know when to come in if, if you, all you did was. So there are a couple of other things that we need to do to try and see if we can get others to, to respond to our beat. So um, let's make sure firstly that we have a little bounce at the bottom. Yeah, so we're not simply just stopping, but it's almost as though we're on a trampoline. And as we hit the bottom, we push back up. So um, let's try that once. Here we go. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, bounce, up, bounce, up, down. One, two, one, two, one. Good. Keep going with that for now. That's it. That's it. And now we want to just make sure that we're not bouncing too high. We're not bouncing all the way up here. We're not actually on a trampoline. We're just imagining a trampoline. And conducting less is often more. Almost always. So let's just see if we can make little, tiny little bounces. Yeah. Keeping your feet on the trampoline as it were without lifting them off. So let's um, let's see if we can do that. So one, two, 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 one, two. Good. Wonderful. See if we can do it even smaller, same speed though. One, Let's go big again. One, two, 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 one, one. Good. So let's uh, let's think of a piece that that we've been doing in uh, with youth orchestra recently um, that that would respond maybe to this bond, uh, this beat, which uh, which is Brahms' Hungarian dance. Um, uh, the middle section is in one, as you will remember, and it goes like this. Yeah, let's try that once. So we're just going to let's conduct first. We know the tempo. One, and down. Yeah, so we're going to go one, one, one. Finding that bounce again. Okay, and now we're going to sing the music to ourselves with me. Ready, steady, off we go. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so that's that's how you basically do it. A nice downbeat and an upbeat. Yeah, we'll make sure that we have that nice little bounce and making sure that we don't bounce all the way up into the sky. Economy of gesture is always, always preferable. Good. So the next thing we're going to do is, rather than going up and down in a straight line, we're going to resume our circling, um, and we're going to do it clockwise. So we're going to, when we start up high again, and now rather than going straight down to find our beat, we're going to go do a do a circle. So we're going to go one, one, and one, and one, and one. One, and one, and one, and yeah, so just see if we can close this circle a little bit as well, just make it a little bit smaller. Good, there we are. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, that's it, good, good, good. And just, let's just keep going, just, just let it flow, make sure that everything's nice and relaxed, your shoulders relaxed. We're still hugging that tree. 
Yeah, let me turn it to the side. So we're going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One. And we're leading, we're drawing with the tip of the button or the tip of your fingers. Yeah, that's where the expression is. It's not here, it's not here, but it's here. Yeah, because that's all the button is, a, a, a natural extension of the arm that makes us more visible to the orchestra and easier for them to pick it up. Okay, good, there we are. And now we're going to, rather than counting in two, we're going to count in three, like this. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Yeah, uh, and as you can tell, the circle is, is a really good way of expressing three beats to what sorry three subdivisions to one beat all in one so you've got one maybe two around here three on the other side back to one so one two three one and two and three and one and so on and then if we did this in a circular motion it'd be one two three 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 one two Three, one, two, 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 three, one, two. Do you remember that little tune? from the Dance My Carnival, which again we looked at just a couple of months ago. Um, and that is how you would show that beat. Yeah, we, we, you may remember it's in 3-4, uh, but, but the pulse of the piece is very much one in a bar, isn't it? So the way that the easiest, the most economic way of showing three beats in a bar is that, that circle. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Three, one, two, ta, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, so let's do that together. And um, we know that the, the tune on roughly the tempo, maybe let's go for this. Ba, 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 ba. Let's go for that tempo. So, that's, what's that? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's what we want. So, let's imagine that tempo firstly, and let's just, why not? Let's just conduct to, to no music with, uh, uh, with that tempo. Yeah, one. Two, three, one, two, three, off we go. One, two, three, one, two, three. Good. Now we're going to start the piece in our heads. When we're ready. One, two, three, and off we go. One. Dum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum 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 bim bum bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba ba bum 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 bim bum bum ba bum ba. So, firstly, it's always to do with the breath. Yeah, if you're a wind player or a, a brass player. Uh, even a percussion player and a string player, it's very important always to, to breathe when you're playing your instrument, isn't it? Uh, your breath is a, such a natural, organic way of expressing um, emotion, of expressing feeling, uh, and, and so often when we're feeling anxious, actually, our, uh, you know, our breath it can accelerate or it can, uh, you know, we can have trouble breathing, so our breath is always right connected with our emotions. Uh, and so to tap into that and to tap into the pulse also, it's really important as conductors to, to make sure that we always breathe with everything that we do. So, uh, let's go back to the first example that we did of the Brahms. Yeah? Now, if you're in a choir, uh, or need, as I said, a wind or brass player, this will come in quite naturally because you need to breathe to come in, don't you? Uh, as a string player or a percussion player, um, perhaps this will be a little bit of a novelty for you, breathing, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with how, how the concept goes. Um, we want to make sure that we breathe in before and we breathe in in the in the right way before we come in. So without even conducting, 
We know the tune. Yep, up, 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 um. We know that it's a jolly, nice little tune, isn't it? A very upbeat, fairly fast. So we don't want to breathe. <gasps> yep, up, 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 up. <laughs> That's quite hard to do, actually, isn't it? So we actually just want to take a very light, fresh little breath, breath like this. <gasps> yep, up, 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 yep, up, 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 don't we? Yeah. Good. So let's try that together. And then we're going to do the same thing, just showing it through our, uh, through our baton. So, showing the breath in our baton. So going up with the breath. Yeah, so it's... It's up, down. Up, down. Yeah, like this. Try it. So just imagine once that uh, we have an orchestra, you have an orchestra in front, in front of you, but it might could be the uh, Cambria Youth Orchestra or whatever orchestra you want. Um, and let's see if we can bring them in together, yeah? So maybe we could even, before you start, you could do a little gesture just to group them all in, herd them in as well. Good. Bring their attention to your beat. Bring their attention to your breath. Think of the tempo. What should a conductor's technique show? Should a conductor be more like a glorified metronome and stand in front of the orchestra with clear beat patterns and consistent tempo, allowing the orchestra to do the rest? Or should the conductor convey how the music should be played, showing the, sh uh, showing the shape of the phrase, or even just the overall emotion of a musical passage? If we were to take these two examples uh, to an even wider extreme, on one hand, you'd have a conductor in front of an orchestra who is precise and consistent with his or her tempi to a superhuman degree. He or she shows exactly how fast or slow the music should be played, believing that the musicians in front of him or her are more than capable of interpreting the music and how it should be played by themselves. On the other hand, you have a conductor who barely beats time at all, instead preferring to show exactly how the music should be played and leave the counting and timekeeping up to the experienced musicians in front of him or her. Now, of course, these are two extremes and both are equally unlikely. But the question is an important one, as it forces us to think about what it is that the orchestra needs from the conductor. This can depend from piece to piece, often even from phase to phase. So before we actually get into beat patterns, I thought this might be a good moment just to talk a little bit about what it is our right hand is actually showing here. Um, now we are, you know, we've practiced our downs and ups and downs and ups, and um, you know that kind of bouncing. That is the beat we're showing, the beat, the pulse of a piece. Yes, and that can be fast, or it can be slow. Yeah, and just by showing the basic tempo, the basic speed of a piece of music, we allow the musicians around us just to, to hone in on that one same tempo and to make music together thereby. Okay, so that's, that's it's a very, very important function of any conductor just to show the tempo, to show the beat clearly, very clearly. Okay, so with that in mind, as you know, sometimes the beats uh, in a piece of music are grouped uh, into various different time signatures. Sometimes we have 2-4, 3-4, 4-4. Four, 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 four. So I'm going to show you those basic beats, firstly, beginning with 2-4, and it's actually not very far away from what we've just been doing. So let's just resume uh, what we've been doing. We've been doing this up-down, so let's uh, let's resume the straight line up-down. So 1-2, uh, 1-2, one, two, one, two. remember the little bounce, 2-1, don't go too high up, not too high up, Economy of gesture, good. One, two, good. Now watch. One, two, one, two, one, two, one. So what did I do there? I came down to hit my downbeat right in front of me, like I always do. Then after I did that, I went over to the right to get give myself a little bit of space so I could show two the second beat of that bar in the same spot again before going up. So it's one, two, one, two. 
just hold out your left hand like so, or your right hand, depending on which hand you're uh, beating with, um, and just practice that once. So we're going down, one, out to the right, in again, two, and up. And now let's just get a little bit of flow into that motion. Here we go, one, two, one, two, one, two. And let's get a little faster, one, two, one, two, one, two. Let's drop the left hand, two, one, two, one, two. And let's see if we can make this very small, a very small gesture, two, one, two, one, two, two, one, two. Exactly. Now, we know a piece uh, that we did fairly recently, that it's in 2-4, uh, the Juba dance. Yeah, so that's in a fairly fast 2-4. So let's just get into that 2-4 firstly. It goes like this. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Okay, and let's sing together. One, two, off we go. Yeah, so that's that's our two four. Good. So if we wanted to add one other beat to it, so make it a three four, we would come down straight in front of us like so again. One. Two now is to the right, so two is out to the right of us. So if you're doing it with the left hand, it would be one out, not in that direction, but out direction. Yeah. So so the, the second beat is always out fr from us, not 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 in. Yeah. So that's the important distinction to make. So um, one going to the outside, going back up. So one, two, three. Like so. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Now I'm sure most of you will have been washing your hands a lot recently, singing maybe this very famous tune, and it's in three four. So I thought this would be a good idea just to sing this uh, while conducting this. Um, Happy birthday to one, two, three, and one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, let's try that together. Ready? Off we go. Is a one, two. Happy birthday to you too. Happy birthday to you too. Happy birthday, dear whoever. Happy birthday to you. Oh. Yeah. So that's that's very basically how the three four passing goes. And as ever. Before we move on, let's just try and see if we can make this as small as possible. So we're going to start large. One, two, three. Getting smaller, 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 smaller. And tiny. One, two, one, two. Good. So next we have 4-4. Four, four. And all it is is adding one other beat, as you may expect, to the 3-4. Uh, we start, as always, down the middle for one. Now we're going to cross inside for two. We're going to go all the way over one, like a big arch like this, for three. And for four, we're going to come back in the middle and bounce up. Let's try that together. Ready? Starting high. One. Inside for two over for three to the outside, good, back to the middle for four, and up. Good, let's try this slowly but organically, so without stopping, here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, 
two, three, four. And very important actually is how we go in between each beats of the music. Yeah, it's very important. That actually shows a lot of information, just that, but by itself um, can transmit a lot of musical information to the orchestra. So be very conscious of placing that beat every time. Let's try that one more time together. Off we go. Ah. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Ba ya ba 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 Remember that tune from the Rhapsody in Blue? Let's try that together. Ready? Here we go. One, two, off we go. Ba ya ba 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 ya ba 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 Wonderful. Now sometimes, sometimes you will see me in rehearsal say, um, this is in two, this is in two, even though it says 4-4 four, four in the time signature. So technically the bar has four crotchet beats in a bar, but the pulse, the feel of the music is very much in two. Let me give you an example. Yeah, if I were to do that in four, like it is, it is in four four. I'm showing a lot more. I'm I'm I'm, I'm almost in the way of uh, of the music making, aren't I? This uh, the, the showing two beats in a the bar there rather than four is much more uh, easy for for the musicians to follow and much more in keeping with the overall mood of the music. So let me sh show you that again, the 2-4, oh, sorry, the 2-2, two, uh, two, two, I suppose, in that in this case. Rather than Yeah, there's a, it's a lot less hectic, there's a lot less going on, therefore it's much easier uh, to pick up what's going on. So. It's sometimes, uh, sometimes if you hear me say in rehearsal, this is in two, that basically just means that I'll be beating in two even though the time signature is in four. For any of you who might be considering doing a bit of conducting yourselves, I wanted to take this opportunity to pass on some of the advice I've been given when I first started out in conducting. The first bit of advice I would have is to get involved in playing with as many different groups as you can. Before I ever even stood in front of an orchestra, I'd spent years playing in youth orchestras, school orchestras and wind bands. I'd also sang with youth choirs and accompanied string players from the piano as part of a duet or a trio. I think any opportunity you can get to make music with others is a great conducting lesson in itself. Because you learn about what it is that musicians need to effectively communicate with one another or what musicians might look for from the conductor, and so on. On top of this, knowing how to play an orchestral instrument to a decent standard will give you a great insight into how to rehearse them. For example, if you are a wind or a brass player, you will know that taking the right kind of breath before playing is very important. Therefore, you would try and incorporate breathing into your gestures when you bring in a brass or a wind player. Chamber music playing as part of a string quartet, a piano trio, or a small vocal ensemble can also be very, very beneficial for developing not only your sense of musicianship, but also your ability to communicate musicality and musical information without the use of words. So, that's my first bit of advice. Before you wish to lead an orchestra or a choir, familiarize yourself with uh, what it's like to be part of either or both of these groups. Secondly, find or create opportunities for yourself to, uh, to conduct a group of people as soon as possible. Conducting is an unusual musical activity as we need a group of musicians to conduct in order to actually make music. In other words, there is only so much you can learn by practicing your beat patterns or your technique at home, although that is also very important. Getting hands-on experience of conducting any ensembles is by far the best way to really learn the art of conducting. 
The first ensemble I ever conducted, for example, was my school orchestra. And from there I asked my teachers if it would be possible to conduct the other school ensembles too. And most of them were very happy for me to do so. On top of this, I asked a few friends of mine if they'd be happy to play along while I conducted them, and we got together a few times a month to make music together. These opportunities to conduct a group of friends were amazing initial experiences from which I learned a lot because friends tend to be very patient with you if you make mistakes, and uh, you will have a very uh, friendly and hopefully a very supportive environment in which to take your first steps as a conductor. So, if you're interested in becoming a conductor, my second piece of advice would be to ask your music teachers at school or the conductors of whatever ensemble you are currently a member of uh, if they would be happy for you to get a bit of conducting experience. Uh, whatever their reply, there is absolutely no harm in asking. And if it doesn't work out uh, that way, try and see if you could get a group of friends together who would be happy for you to play along as you conduct. Um, whatever you decide. Creating opportunities for yourself to conduct a group of people as soon as possible is really effective um, and it's a really important way of taking those first steps as a conductor and gaining some vital hands-on experience. So lastly let me talk about what the other hand does, the hand that doesn't have the baton in it, the hand that isn't beating time. And this is a much more elusive and much more controversial perhaps topic. Um, because the left hand uh, can do any number of things. It can bring people in, of course. Um, it can show cues. Uh, it can go and she can show us um, how you want the music. You know, short and light, or nice and broad. Um, it can show um, intensity, uh, or it can show um, suspense. Um, it can show a lot of things. And of course, it's not just the left hand. It's our overall body language that comes into it. But to keep it basic, uh, we're going to two, le learn two things um, just now. Uh, one is to make uh, mu the music louder, which is very much in the left hand, and to try and make it quieter. Okay, so let's go back into our full four firstly with our right hand. Here we go. One, two, three, four, one. And we're going to try and make it louder. And I'll show you how. Here we go. Yeah, so this was me showing that, uh, sorry, a crescendo, getting getting louder, and then <clears throat> we're in a louder tempo. Yeah, let's try it once together. Ready? It is one, two, three, four, one, like that. Yeah, try that again. Off we go. One, two, three, four, one, like so. Good, good, good. And the opposite. Um, getting quieter, would go, it could go something like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, so all I did there was put a hand down like so, and I moved it into the center. Yeah, just gradually, quietly. Try it again. Try it together. Here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Another key aspect of the role of a conductor is to be true to the composer. What does that mean? It means that it's a conductor's responsibility to perform a piece of music in the way that the composer would have wanted it to be performed. Some composers, like Gustav Mahler for example, went as far as to write very detailed instructions into the orchestral scores to ensure that conductors perform their works in the manner that they envisaged it to be performed. Even with composers such as Beethoven, who left comparatively few notes on how to perform his pieces, there is a lot of detail in the articulation and dynamic markings to guide the interpretative decisions of the conductor. And on top of this, there are also so many hints left to us from other sources as to how a piece of music at the time of Beethoven would have been performed. That said, every conductor has different views on exactly how they would like to conduct a Beethoven symphony. 
just pause this video and go and listen to a, uh, at least two different recordings of the beginning of Beethoven's famous Fifth Symphony on YouTube, Spotify or iTunes. Try and see if you can hear the differences between them, which could include anything from tempo to articulations uh, or to how long the pauses are at the beginning of the piece. Go on and just come back to this video once you're done. Now, whichever recordings you happen to listen to, uh, they may have been very similar, or not very similar at all. They were, however, both interpretations of the same piece of music. So, interpretation is a key element of the conductor's job. There are many different ways of going about it, and each conductor will have a different approach. But for me, I always try and make sure that I can back up my interpretations with good reasons if I'm asked about them. I do this by doing a little detective work. I analyse the score in front of me to find any useful hints that the composer might have left me, and I also try to find some uh, more context from the various literary sources available to me. For example, Mozart's father, Leopold, was a prominent string player himself and wrote a book on string technique, uh, which is often quoted. So if I wanted to find out how Mozart might have expected his string music to be performed, reading this book would be a good start. At the same time, nothing can be more demotivating to an orchestra than if you stand in front of them and tell them exactly how you want the music to be performed and why you decided to do it this way. There we go back to this element of trust in the relationship between the conductor and the orchestra. So now that we've discovered our beat patterns, I thought it might be a good idea just to uh, talk very briefly about how we can show an accelerando, so that is tempo getting faster, um, or a ritelando, or a rallentando, and that being tempo getting slower, um, in the beat. How we can incorporate that into the beat. I'll go through some, some very basic uh, pointers as to how to do that. Let's uh, start by simply just resuming our 4-4 four, four, uh, beat pattern. Here we go. So down, inside, outside, up. So with the left hand that would be down, inside, outside, up. Yeah, here we go, try that again. Is down, inside, outside, up. Keep going, two, three, four. Now remember how we talked about the importance of how the beat travels from beat to beat. So right now we're placing it and we're placing it a little arcs almost in between each beat, aren't we? So arc, 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 up. Yeah, we're placing these little bridges between each beat. Yeah. Now, if we want the music to get faster, the very simple trick is to make these little arcs, these little bridges, smaller. Like so. So as you're getting faster, the bridges are getting smaller. Like so. Let's try this together once. Here we go. So we're going to start nice and slow and broadly. Down, two, three, four. Now these are big bridges we're building in between each beat. Yeah? Okay. Wonderful. Okay. And let's get faster. One, two, three. Make those bridges smaller. Two, three, four. One, Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, and so on. Yes? So that's how we get faster. So if you want to slow down the music, it's exactly the opposite principle. Rather than making the bridges smaller between the beats, we're going to make them bigger, gradually. Okay? So, let's start relatively quickly and uh, with small bridges. Uh, let me demonstrate this tempo. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, with small bridges. Try that together. Off we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Good. And now we're going to start with that tempo and gradually we're going to build bigger bridges. Let me demonstrate once. One, two, three, four. 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 Yeah, and that's a valentando. So let's do that together. Small, starting small. One, 
two, three, four, getting bigger, three, four, one, two, even bigger, and bigger still, three, four, one, two, three, four. And there we have it, we've slowed down. If you're preparing a piece of music to conduct, it can be very tempting to put on a recording and try out your conducting while the recording is playing. This is not a good, good idea for several reasons. Uh, firstly, if you're conducting a recording, you're not actually conducting at all. Rather, you're reacting, reacting, to the sound of the orchestra or choir, led by a different conductor. Remember, as conductors, it is our job to create the sound, not to sit back and enjoy it. In other words, you should be leading the orchestra rather than being led by it, which is exactly what happens if you're conducting along to a recording. The other drawback of doing this is that you are learning somebody else's interpretation of a piece of music. So in effect, you are learning to copy somebody else's ideas, which is never a good idea. As difficult and elusive as it sounds, it's always best to be yourself. That is a very difficult concept to grasp when you're only just starting out and it takes time to develop your own approach. But if you're copying somebody else's ideas, then that process will be delayed and perhaps never really come to fruition. But I want to be clear, I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to recordings at all. In fact, listening to recordings, or better still, going to live performances is vital in order to build your understanding of the vast amount of repertoire, both old and new, that is available to us. Well, everybody, that was our video. I really hope you enjoyed that uh, and found it useful. And I hope it went some way to answering some of your questions. Um, if you have any other questions or any other things that I didn't discuss today, of which there are many, uh, then please always feel free to talk to me. Uh, and I really look forward already to seeing all of you at our next rehearsal. Until then, stay safe, everybody, and um, enjoy the rest of your summer.